opening plenary speaker, Jake Widden. Jake has been working in the East Asia region as an English language teaching professional since 2004 and has trained young learner English teachers in China, Japan, Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, and Myanmar. He is particularly interested in children's motivation, developing creativity, learner autonomy, and the connections between teachers, parents, and caregivers, and schools. Jake is currently StudyCat's Head of Academic Experience. During Jake's plenary, we recommend watching in speaker view, and if you have any questions, please type them in the Q&A box. Without any further ado, please share your screen, Jake. Okay. Let me just make sure, mute the chat for a second. Okay, if everybody can hear me, can they just type yes? And I'll be very happy. Yes, awesome. That means we have people. Wonderful. Hi, everybody. Great to meet you all. So I'm coming to you tonight, but your daytime from a little bit cold Shanghai, where I'm based. Wow, from Leon. We got people from all around the world here today. How exciting. Nice, nice, nice. Wonderful, loud and clear. Oh, a few people, a few names I recognize in there. Wonderful. Wow, Italy, Indonesia, Philippines, all over the world. So today I'm going to be talking about, let me just open this up. We're going to be talking about connecting homes and schools for learning centered young learner or young years English classes. Hi guys, hi from Bangladesh and Vietnam. So what are we going to, firstly, I'll just do a little bit of a recap about who I am. So you have, so you know who's talking to you for the next 45 minutes. After 45 minutes, we'll be able to have some questions. And I am just going to set my timer so I know how long I've been talking for. Uh, who am I? Oh, sorry, I've just hit the chat box. I'm just going to put the chat down there so I can see it. Perfect. So my name is Jake Wynn, as David already told you. I have been lucky enough to live in these three cities. If anyone knows these three cities, they'll get a little prize. Uh, they're all based in China. Uh, for the last 15 years, I've worked in EF, uh, Macmillan Education as a regional Asia trainer. I used to be a CERT TESOL and DIP TESOL uh, course director for Trinity College London over here in China. Well done to David Weller there. And I'm currently the head of learning experience at StudyCat. And as David said, I've been lucky enough to train teachers in all these countries. But since the COVID-19 uh, school closures, we've been upping a lot of training around the world on webinars. So I've had the opportunity to meet teachers now in 92 countries, which has just been a absolute pleasure. And lastly, I think that it's worth mentioning that my biggest passion is, oh, Mark Yellen, good to see you there. Uh, my biggest passion in, in language learning is learner autonomy. And a lot of what we're going to talk about today is going to be about learner autonomy. So what are we talking about today? Well, we're going to do four things, okay? Number one, we're going to talk about the science of learning. Because we want to know about learner-centered classrooms, we need to know how people learn. We're going to talk about connecting homes and schools, because I think this is one of the keys to young learner learning. We're going to talk about integrating ed tech and, oh, wonderful, Rosa, and I'm going to have a few final thoughts at the end for you. Oh, and we're also going to talk about invisible gorillas, ladybugs, surfing, and data, one of my favorite things. So are you all ready? Great. Well, I'd love to start with a very short story because I always start my presentations with a story. When, oh, firstly, I'd start with asking two questions, sorry. So the first question I want to answer today in this presentation is, how do we know learning is happening? How do we know learning is happening? We all teach our students. We all think we understand what is happening, but we, do we really know whether our students are learning? That's number one. 
And the second question I want to answer is, how can we increase meaningful learning in our classes? So how do we know learning is happening and how can we increase meaningful learning in our classes? But of course, as I just said, I always start with a story. So I'd like to start with this story. When I first started teaching, uh, way back in 2003, actually, I went and did a kind of like a uh, cert TESOL course. And I, you know, it was 160 hours and I learned about teaching vocabulary and teaching grammar. And then, and I did my teaching practice all with adults. And then I flew over to China, landed in a school. And the first thing I was presented with on my first day of teaching was something that looked like this. A classroom full of young learners, full of four-year-olds and five-year-olds and six-year-olds. It was very, very quickly that I realized that a lot of what I had learned on my course wasn't going to help me that much. I tried to, yeah, exactly. I tried to go in to my class and use, you know, I'm going to teach some vocabulary and now some grammar. And I had to throw that out pretty quickly. I, you know, only two hours of my course was focused on young learner teaching out of 160 hours. Now I know a lot of CERT TESOL courses and, and TEFL courses have changed now to integrate more young learner teaching, but it was quite overwhelming for a new teacher. But what that did for me was it encouraged me to start learning about young learner teaching from day one. I had to be focused in, I had to really think about how am I going to teach these young learners? Hey, from your man. Well, I'll, I'll answer the questions at the end, okay? So I'll ask a few questions and then at the end, we can put them in the question box. So straight away, I started to notice two issues. And these two issues are really the foundation and the premise of what I'm going to talk about today. The first issue, the first uh, issue that I noticed was when I was teaching my classes, we have break times, right? I'm sure you all have. And my students in the break times were allowed to play with blocks. They were allowed to do drawing. They were allowed to do coloring. They were allowed to read books. So I would leave. And then when I came back, I noticed that they're all in there playing together, working together. And it was so hard to drag them away from that focused attention that they had. That it, what it appeared to me was that in the break time, they seem to be learning more than coming back into my class. Because what, I know, what, what we were seeing was kids focused, they were collaborating, they were being creative, they were challenging themselves, you know, they were building blocks, trying to see who could go the highest, who could make the coolest thing, and they were having a lot of fun. And then they had to come back into my class and start doing things on the board and focus on what I was telling them to do, which was very interesting for young learners. Yes, I would definitely share all these slides with everybody. So that was the first thing I noticed. The second thing I noticed back then was I used to live in an area where many of my students also lived in my apartment block. So I would be really proud of my classes and kids would start talking to me in class. But then I'd see these children out and about around my area. So I'd walk over to them and I'd think to say, I'm gonna say hello to this kid and I'm going to ask them a question from class and their parents are gonna be so happy because I'm such a good teacher. So I would walk up and I'd say, hi, Mary, what are you doing? And Mary would say, huh, and hide behind her mom or hide behind her dad. And I found this time and time again, or they would say, I am shop going and they'd make all these mistakes. So what I found was outside my class, my students just simply weren't using English. They weren't speaking English and, this really you know, kind of shocked me because I thought they were doing so well in class. So from those two stories, it really was the first time that I realized that there was a connection that needs to happen for young learners, right? There needs to be this connection between the home and the school, that learning doesn't just exist in the school, 
especially learning a language, because learning a language is not necessarily a subject, right? If I'm six years old, I don't know I'm learning the subject. It's a skill that I want to acquire. And if they can't speak the language outside the classroom, I'm not really doing my job as a teacher. What I kept asking myself is, am I offering the best opportunities for learning? Am I offering the best opportunities for learning? So I started to look at my own teaching and I realized that in my first year, I was very teacher centered. It was me at the front, following some flashcards, holding up the flashcards saying, Apple, 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 Apple. And it was all about me. Everyone had to be focused on me. And then I realized I had to flip that around a bit and it became much more student centered. So that's great, right? And I thought, but what I was so focused on being student centered that I would, you know, not even integrate, interact with the students sometimes because I didn't want to be teacher centered. So that really led me on to being learning centered. And there's quite a difference there between teacher centered and student centered and learning centered. <laughs> so learning centered is all about this idea that is learning happening. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's student centered or teacher centered. It's is learning happening. But what is learning? This, <laughs> this is a very, very difficult question, right? Because if if we're going to make things learning centered, we better understand learning quite well, right? I really like this quote from the president of MIT. He says, if we don't know how we learn, how on earth do we know how to teach, right? If we don't know how to learn, how on earth are we going to know how to teach? And I really like this quote. So this is kind of the premise. What's been really exciting over the last five years for me, as I've gotten deeper into research and doing uh, dissertations, et cetera, is this sort of cross-pollination of discourses. So um, a lot of people from cognitive scientists, uh, neuroscience, educational psychologists, early learning psychologists are coming together now to talk about things like language learning and what is happening in the brain while we're learning. So a lot of what I'm talking in the next parts of this are coming from four people. Firstly, from the uh, very infamous Patricia Cool, who is who I really recommend this paper on early language acquisition. From Katarina Gospic, who is a neuroscientist beta based out of Sweden, who focuses on AR and XR and all those things, good things to do with learning. From Kathy Hirsch. Uh, yeah, let's, I'll get to there. Um, Kathy hirsch Pasek, who's really, who's a child educational psychologist, who's all about how children learn, learn naturally. And lastly, Stan Nislas de Haan, I hope I'm saying that right, who's a French, French cognitive scientist. So the, thought, the three things we're going to talk about come from these guys, and you can look them all up later. Um, so from all of these, all of these guys together, and all the things I've been looking at, it, it really highlighted three main things. Now, today, I won't be doing them justice. I just have picked a lot of what these guys are saying and tried to condense them into three things that should help you when you're out there with your young learner classes and just as a mindset in the back of your mind, always thinking about these three things. Number one is uh, attention. Number two, I'll, I'll explain further. Number two is the idea of minds on active learning, active minds on learning. And finally is this idea of feedback and flow. So attention, minds on learning and feedback and flow. Let's go further. So attention is a really interesting one. Who has heard of the invisible gorilla test? Who has heard of the invisible gorilla test? If you have, just type yes in the chat box. I'm fascinated. Awesome, Spencer Moores. Oh, great. So no's, yes, I think I have. No, no, no. Well, half and half. Okay, great. I'll just do a quick one on the invisible gorilla test, right? So the invis invisible gorilla test was a test that some, some researchers put together to look at learning. 
So you can see from this picture that what the uh, participants had to do, they had to watch the video and they had to tick every time someone in a white t-shirt was holding the ball and they had to tick every time someone in a black t-shirt was holding the ball. So then they were really focused in all their attention on this task. If it was a white t-shirt, make a tick. If it was a black t-shirt, make a tick. What the researchers did is that they put a gorilla, uh, sorry, not a real gorilla, but a gorilla in a suit ran through the video. Amazingly, less than half the people noticed the gorilla. So what is that saying? That if you're not noticing the gorilla, it's because your attention was 100% focused in on this task. And it was an amazing discovery because it made all the cognitive scientists realize that it this idea of attention is so important to learning. So I want you to think about that is what are we doing to keep our kids attention? That was uh, Simons and Chabri in 1999. Uh, another little story from Katerina Gospic, which I really like is this idea of the ladybug. And I, I'm trying to tell this in stories so you can re remember these later. So the invisible gorilla and the ladybug. The ladybug is this idea that when you're walking along with your child, and if any of you have kids, you will see this. They see a ladybug, a lady beetle, they pick it up and they wanna play with it, right? They wanna to touch it. They wanna see what happens. They wanna let it fly away. They wanna investigate it. They are so focused their attention on this ladybug. But if you put that ladybug in a classroom and said, I am now going to teach you about ladybugs, you might not get that complete attention on the learning. So um, this idea is that when you have the ladybug, you really, because the child has chosen to look at the ladybug, they're going to be much more engaged in that. So this is all about reducing distractions, focusing on tasks and motivation through choice. But there's a few little things we can be doing in our classes and homes to, to, to ensure attention is happening. Things like choice menus. Uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time giving you all the different practical ideas because there's so many cool ideas over the next three days. But, you know, things like choice menus, giving the child the chance to choose what they're going to see, like the ladybug. So at the end of a class, you might say, okay, I want you to take that language today and you can either draw it or act it out or say it or do a work alone or as a whole class. But by giving kids that choice, they're going to be more focused in and have attention on that. And you, you would have noticed that um, a lot. That's the previous slide, <laughs> but I can't keep going back. The other thing is, you know, lots of creativity activities, anything that involves creativity is involving the child having some ownership over that. So they're going to have more attention on it. And things like focusing on task-based learning. So for example, if you're teaching colors, you could just hold up flashcards or let them build a tower. If they're building the tower, they're focused in on the task. They get to choose where everything goes. And then they have to say the colors as they're building it, right? Blue, green, they could be on top or below. So just by having that task-based learning, you're really focusing on the attention part of the mind. That's number one. Number two is this idea of active minds on learning. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so this uh, definition comes from Stanislas Dehan, and I don't think I'm saying that right if anyone's French, but uh, yeah, exactly, uh, Rakshana, exactly. So with active minds on learning, the guiding, this is all taken from him, okay? The guiding principle could not be clearer. A passive organism does not learn. Number two, active engagement must be promoted. The teacher can achieve active engagement only if the learner, learner or the student or learner engages themselves. So it's all about the child having to engage themselves. It's not just about you trying to force them to be engaged. So there has to be some learner autonomy. But listen to this last part and tell me what it reminds you of. And he says, making learning conditions, I just need to read my slide here. <laughs> making learning conditions more difficult will paradoxically lead to increased engagement and cognitive effort, which improves also attention. So making conditions a little bit 
more reasonably difficult actually increases the cognitive effort and engagement. What does that remind you of in language learning that we often talk about? That reminds me of a theory from language learning we often hear about making things a little bit more difficult. Yes, Annabella Washerlin, the zone of proximal development. So it's just so lovely now to see that cognitive science is showing that all these ideas from uh, Vygotsky's ZPD, zone of proximal development, or Krashen and Terrell's input hypothesis, they are in reality what is happening in the brain. So how does that work at home, right, or in class? So one of the first keys is really think about this idea of always reducing passive activities. I, and, and you can really see this, there's this idea that you can send a child home and say, watch a video and learning will happen. But if you're just sending them home with a video, how is there any learning happening if they're being quite um, uh, passive, right? So what you can be doing is say you send home a video it might be much more interesting to say, okay, here's a two minute video. You need to find how many times you see a red thing or how many times you see yellow or how many animals can you see? Always apply a task to the passive activity. So at home, before they come to class, they're going to be more engaged, right? And remember, <laughs> it's I plus one, not I plus five. But if you're allowing these mind uh, these active learning activities at home you're allowing them to go plus one most learners will push themselves to the state that they need to be in to be learning and remember yeah because every child or every student has their own plus one uh, and i think that's really important to remember it's not one size fits all in your classes which i'm sure you know yeah, neither I plus negative one either, right? Okay, this last one to me is the most interesting and it's where a lot of the new research is coming and it's the hardest one to adapt to language learning, but it's super cool. Feedback and flow. So who has tried this before? Anyone has tried this before? Awesome, Andrew. Okay, well, I'm from Australia and I can say I've never tried this before, but I know a lot of people who have. So in surfing, it's really a great example of feedback and flow. When you're on a surfboard, uh, I will share all the slides out guys, you'll all be sent the slides, so don't worry. When you're on a surfboard, you kind of get up and you start trying to ride it and you're getting feedback from how you're falling and you're going over and all your senses. And then you try to correct. So you start falling this way and you try to correct this way. And then you start falling this way and you try and correct. And eventually you can surf. This is this idea that you're getting feedback and then you get into the flow and then you can start surfing. It's very similar to learning uh, music. When you are trying to play piano or the flute or violin, you, you don't need someone there telling you those mistakes. It's like, <laughs> you will know to change your note because your brain is predicting what it's going to hear and then it starts to go, oh, I heard an error, I better make a change and then it makes a change and you get into this kind of flow of learning. People often talk about it with when you're typing something and the red line comes up if you've made a mistake, you sort of breaks your flow but then you correct and keep moving forward. So this is this, is this idea of feedback and flow it's what Stanislas said, oh, sorry, Dahan, Dahan says, what he talks about is this idea that we, the brain makes a prediction of what's going to happen. It, it gets feedback from an error. Then we make a correction and then we make a new prediction. And it just keeps going and going and going. Like when a child is first learning to ride a bicycle, right? They're kind of riding, oh, that's the feedback, I'm falling off. And then I keep going and then I correct and then I keep trying to go forward and then they eventually do it. Uh, Dehan says that learning is triggered by, learning is triggered by error signals and that allows us to adjust, right? Learning is triggered by learning signals that will allow us to adjust. We need these error signals. And he also says, 
that errors are essential to learning. Essentially, if you're not making errors, you're not learning. And you can see how this relates to the active learning as well. So it's feedback and flow is about letting those errors come at you so you can keep going forward. Uh, in home, class and home, this is a hard one, right? So I think that when you're at home trying to encourage kids, like game-based activities, obviously, because um, game-based activities, obviously, because it's getting kids into some sort of flow. Task-based activities, if they're sort of building something, they're trying to into a flow of correcting and not correcting. And lastly, language learning apps, which obviously I'm going to talk about because I work for a language learning app company, but it's a lot of the research I've been doing in the last year. So that was a lot to take in there. So what does all that mean for teachers of very young learners? Well, I think it means two things. It means that these principles can really help students with their motivation, their focus and their learning outcomes. But it also helps you as a teacher when you're trying to develop tasks or you're choosing new content or you're deciding on new resources as a team, you're thinking, are they including attention? Is there any active learning happening really? Or is there any feedback in the flow? And remember importantly that these three things do not just stand alone, right? They don't stand, they don't just separate, they all overlap together. So in the second part of this, I'm gonna talk about how ed tech works with all of this, but keep that in mind for today is that if you remember three things today, it's that, it, that they need attention to focus, they need to be challenged and active, and they need to get into that feedback and flow for learning to happen. So what does ed tech have to do with all of this? Well, a lot actually. Uh, let's have a little look. So since the COVID-19 school closures, it, it's really accelerated this idea of adopting digital tools. I mean, if you just, if anyone in this chat taught online in the last six months, and I'll be amazed if it's not all yeses, just type yes if you taught online. Uh, yeah, of course, right? So what's happened is it's, 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 in, it's accelerated the adoption of all these digital tools, right? These are some of the guys that I work with and they, they, even they had to stay at home and learn with their kids at home. Uh, Citibank just did a recent report into digital learning and they said that 50% of learning by 2024 will be digital. I'll, you can, I'll send it out later. We did a survey at about June this year. We had a couple of hundred teachers around the world and they said 90% of the teachers said they think schools should adopt some of the lessons learned from the online teaching they did when schools open again. So we've seen this change. We know ed tech is coming, right? But we've, we've heard all this before, right? Like I've been a teacher for 15 years and I've seen so many people tell me this is going to change things. And for many, many years. So back in the, you know, way back in the 30s, we saw radios come into classrooms and it was going to change everything to make learning better. Um, we saw overhead projectors. We saw things like who still remembers using a tape recorder? When I first started, you had to stop and start a tape recorder. VHS was going to revolutionize a classroom. The CD player was going to do it. <laughs> yeah. And then we saw projectors and, and televisions and uh, computer screens coming in. All of these things were going to revolutionize. And lastly, IWBs. But there's something about all of those. They're all hardware. Oh, <laughs> I was going to ask you a question. Yeah, dance pads as well, Mr. Ian Frankish. I remember those well. So what do you think has been the biggest change in hardware? If you can all think all of these things, something happened in 2008 that completely changed the way uh, we think about uh, technology in the classroom. It was something was released in 2008. Yeah, exactly, Rachel Stone. Very good, first off the board. When the smartphone and tablets were released, it changed everything about digital technology. And think about it. How many times today have you used your phone? How many times in this presentation have you had a little look at your phone? So have a look at all of these things on the screen now. These will relate to what I've been talking about. All these things on the screen now, what do they have in common that is different from the last things I showed you? 
what are all, all these things? What do they all have in common? Whoever could answer this gets 10 points. Ah, Miss Zara, very good. And Juta and Rashini, these are all software. Yeah, they're all apps, right? They're all software and all of them you have used in the last couple of weeks of your life. And they all have done something to make your life more convenient. And they've all done things like giving you data to make your life better in some ways and sometimes worse. But on the whole, all of these things have been integrated into your life. And they're all software. They're not hardware. So we're willing to integrate all this new software into every aspect of our life. But why not then in education? And we are seeing it in education. I don't use TikTok, okay, but I just put it up there because for the younger people, because I'm quite old. Um, but what, what is happening with software in education and how does it relate to that learning-centered education? So I just want to quickly define ed tech because I think a lot of us who work in ed tech uh, are misconstrued sometimes or misinterpreted in what it's the definition of ed tech. Uh, ed tech, I would define it as ed tech refers to the software designed to enhance teacher-led learning. So usually something to do with a teacher or a school. It doesn't mean replacing a teacher. Uh, in classrooms and homes to improve students' educational outcomes. So the goal of everyone I know in ed tech is to improve educational outcomes. So how do we integrate ed tech into our uh, classrooms? I'm gonna show you two examples today. And I think that um, these are two examples that I have done and I use. And I think that if you see how easy they are, you can start trying to integrate some of these as well. So the first one is going to be from WeChat. Has anyone heard of WeChat? So it could be, it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be WeChat. It could be WhatsApp or Line, depending on where you are, right? Um, WeChat is based in China because that's where I am. Yeah, Luke, hi, Luke. WhatsApp, right? You use WhatsApp. And the second one is an app-based learning, language learning tool. Yeah, Skype doesn't work as well as this for this activity. So, this is what I was doing this a long time before the school closures. And now we're seeing even the government schools in China are taking this on as an activity. So I will use my phone and I will record just a quick 20 second. Let me just get a pen here because I think it's interesting. I just record a quick 20 second uh, little activity, a, a little model of language. So in this video, what I modeled was I modeled to the students, hi kids, what did you do yesterday? I went to the shops and I bought an apple and it was yummy. So hi kids, what did you do yesterday? I went to the shops and I bought an apple and, uh, um, and it was yummy. And then I send that out to the kids in the group which is a closed group, but all the parents have agreed that it's okay to send these out. So we send out these activities. Let me just clear. Uh huh. And each of the kids get that and they have to look at the model I've given to them. Now, I, I've been teaching that language, but I don't tell them what to do. I just tell them you have to do something with that. What happens is they're totally actively engaged in that, right? They have a model that they can work with each student chooses that um, what they need to do with it, and then they reply to me. So then, you know, uh, someone like Lisa here will reply quite long. Yesterday, I went to the shops and I had fun. But Denver would say, yesterday, I go shopping, I am happy. So then I get all this language learning back from the home. So then exactly uh, when they come into class, I now have something to work with because I've seen what they're doing at home. We're connecting the home and the school and the learning is decided by the kids. They decide what to say. They decide, they always use my model. They decide when to do it and it involves the parents. When they're in class now, they're much more ready for something meaningful. So just a simple activity like this, integrating some ed tech is Two minutes it took me to create that. Two minutes to create that activity. It, I, it means that you hand over the challenge to the students. 
you are fostering some autonomy because they have to then go and do it themselves. You capture their attention because of course they want to look at the phone, stop, start, learn how to do it. You involve the parents because they have to be there. You get to see some real learning happening. You integrate the feedback as part of the class then. When they get into class, then you can start using that to look at what's really happened. And then it's super meaningful because they have made the creation for the content for your class. So literally a minute's work creates a whole class worth of learning. Okay, the next one. Let's see how much. Ooh. Um, this is a language learning app and it's actually the study cat app, but it could be any app really. Um, and I'm just going to show you three little activities from this app. Uh, here's one where we're learning about uh, animals. And this is like the whack-a-mole. Remember the game where you have to hit an at, you know, you hit something down. So as these things pop up, I'm not using a video because I, I wanted to just make it. So um, when the animals pop up, the app will say, it's a rabbit or hit the rabbit. And the kids have to hit the rabbit and then they get some points. If they get it right, it goes boom, points. If they get it wrong, they get ding dong, or it shakes or something. And then after they've done a few, it starts to scaffold up. So it's challenge, actively challenging them to get harder and harder. And then they might have to do hit two lions. So they have to speed up the activity as well. So the language learning is, is getting more increasingly difficult and how they're learning is getting more increasingly difficult. And then they get some points for that. And you can see it gets more difficult again. So in this, they're really focusing their attention. They get instant feedback. They're challenged actively. And they increase interaction. Or they get to interact with target language a lot more. In this activity, this one's really nice because it's just really simple. It's just silhouettes. So what do you think this animal is here? What's this animal here? Hmm. And you've got to think about what it might be, right? Really, really simple activity. And I will share the app name, don't you worry. Yeah, this might be a lion, let's have a look. Yes, it's a lion. So the kids hear the name of an animal and they have to guess which one it is. Here again, they hear the word monkey and then they've got to click on the one that's a monkey. They've only seen the shape, right? So what's that doing? It's focusing their attention on the task it's critical thinking because they've got to relate it to what they already know. There's some scaffolding because it's getting more difficult. There's instant feedback if they get it wrong and it presents the target language in a very engaging way. Here's another activity. Um, I love it. It's just really simple. It's just the cup game. But what's the difference is you, they show you something. So this is new or old. And then you've got to remember where it was. And it's, it's a simple activity. But what it's doing is it's focusing attention, it's active learning, it's giving feedback, and it's engaging with that target language. The difference is, is that you can get feedback to every single learner in your class. And that's something that's very hard in a class. So by giving someone an app at home, they're learning in a much more natural way, and they're getting into that kind of flow state of having fun, and then they're going to have more opportunities to learn with the language. So I think by integrating, uh, I mean, what I have found by integrating apps into my to be able to do that, it lowers anxiety, which Krashen would be delighted to know. It's very motivating because it's fun, right? It focuses their attention in on a task, like we remember with the invisible gorilla or the, or the ladybug. It increases the opportunities for exposure to the language. You know, just keep hearing those words and interacting with those words. Some of them can be adaptive and um, it connects homes and schools by they do some work at home and then we can see what happens. So to continue on, I'm going to speed up a little bit here. So what we see with app-based learning is that it encourages those three things and it connects homes and schools because whatever they're doing at home can feed back data to what they're doing and then you can see that. So let's have a little look at the uh, data um, and what data can come from this type of learning. I call it the wonderful world of data. I absolutely think data is amazing. I, don't, I think we can have too much data, but what's wonderful is we're starting to see data on learning like never before. Can you imagine when you're in a class and you've got 25 kids, 
you don't know what's going on in their heads. You've got to wait till you do a test to maybe find out or ask them a question and get an answer. Now you get data on everything that's happening if you're using the software and tools that are actually available to you, right? So for parents and students, if they're accessing the data from, say, the StudyCat app, they can find out things. So this is Ernesto. Ernesto, we can find out here, he's got an average score of about 86%. He's got no outstanding assignments, lovely. He's played 500 games. He's played for nine hours. He plays for about 12 minutes a day. It's really worth actually looking at how spaced repetition works, but that's another webinar. And he's acquired 400 words. But what's way more important is um, that he that we can now see data on every single word. I can see that he's done really well with new, but maybe struggling over here with clean and dirty. So I know that this learner needs to focus on those words to, to, to acquire them. Mum and dad know that as well. We get data insights into every word. Same with the, with the students, they get feedback on how they're learning. You know, so simple here. Green means they're doing well. Orange means they're doing okay. And red means you've got to keep going. So when a kid sees that, they get more engaged in the learning because they're now aware of how they're learning, which is really nice. Um, no, it's not like Duolingo at all. <laughs> so the other exciting thing is it gives teachers insights. Um, teachers can actually access a whole class aggregate of data, 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 I should say, data. In Australia, we say data, but of data. And, you know, for example, if they were learning animals, I can see how well my whole class is doing. I can see that my kids, all my kids are doing really well with bird and cat, but as a whole class, they're struggling with uh, mouse, rabbit. And so in my next class, I'm gonna focus on things to do with mouse and rabbit. So I'm giving them more of that because I really know how well they're learning. Think, and the other good thing is you can see how well the whole class are going. So you might, you can see up here that these guys are going well, down the bottom, they might need a little bit more, um, yeah, uh, they might need a little bit uh, more help. So you can start learning, thinking about how you're gonna group them. One, one more exciting thing before I finish is, and this is where the future is. This is where, where data is going to go in the future about understanding, are my kids learning? How do I know they're learning? So for those who are into this type of thing, in this graph, you can see on this side, the homework score. And on this axis, you can see the number of repeat plays. Now, the number of repeat plays would be something that shows that my kids are willing to keep going back and learning. So they've got perseverance, right? So in this top graph, I can see these guys are doing really well, but they haven't played much, but that's okay because they're doing quite well. These guys are doing really well and they've played a lot. So these are great students, right? These guys really want to play a lot and they really, and they want to learn a lot and they're doing well with the learning. These guys aren't doing so well with their scores. They're only getting 50%, but they haven't played that much. So we're going to encourage them to keep playing. And the last group, they are the ones I'm worried about because they're playing a lot, but they're struggling with the language. So I need to do maybe an intervention, right? I might need to go in there and uh, focus on those guys and help them out. So this is where data is going to go in the future is we're going to have insights, not just in what they've learned, but we're going to have insights into how kids learn, which is the most exciting thing for me. I have to credit uh, a gentleman called Adam Black here. Um, please check out Adam Black. Adam Black is a guru in, in, in data and insights for young learners and how they learn. So just a few points to wrap up, and these are my final points. I absolutely promise that no one expects that apps can replace a teacher. Please remember that, right? Um, but it can enhance learning like never before. It can help early career teachers make much more informed decisions because you're trying to learn all these new things as an early career teacher. So this will really help you as opposed to trying to replace you. And lastly, it offers the best opportunities for learning, in my opinion. So let's just to just to recap, I asked two questions at the beginning, and it's um, how do we know learning is happening and how can we increase meaningful learning? So to answer the first one, 
if you are aware of the science of learning, so the three things, attention, active learning, and feedback and flow, you will make sure that you are much more likely then to have real learning happening if you apply those principles. Number two, if you integrate apps and data, you get real insights into learning. So that's answering that question. And then how do we increase the meaningful learning is that the more we're doing at home and connecting that home and school, the more that's happening before your class, when they get into class, you can actually focus on all the good stuff like creativity activities, task-based learning, uh, you know, collaboration activities and all the cool things you really wanna do as a teacher and the kids want to do. Like I said at the beginning, the things my kids were doing in the break time really should have been the things I was doing in class time. That's it for me for now. I have one more thing to say after the questions, but um, I now apparently we can answer some questions. Um, I'm going to open up the question box, but thank you very much, everybody. I hope that was informative and I'm going to try and keep up with the questions. Did you join your learners when they learned at home? Actually, that's a really great question. And a oh, very, um, and sem illness. No, but I have a six, I mean, yes, a little bit because I, in my area, I get to know the kids really well. So we kind of have this nice relationship between the parents and the kids, which is where I think learning happens. But more importantly, I have a six-year-old daughter myself. And I think she's taught me more about learning than any of the classes I ever taught because you're seeing it happen in real life. Do you ever find that students get so involved in the activity that they don't pay attention to the language? Annabella, that is a brilliant question. And that's the fine line, right? Um, it, it's that they get so, they, they start just using their L1. But I think if you can make the language as part of the activity, so, you know, they can't finish the activity without saying something, then it's... Um, almost impossible for them to get too engaged in it. You know, simple activity like the classic back to the board game where they've got to sit here and all the kids are shouting out in real time. The task is to get them to know the word, but they're using all that language as part of the task. I hope that answers your question, uh, Annabella. How much more time do we, oh, okay, we've got four more minutes. I think involved, oh, there's so many questions. Uh, which one from which one from memory? Which one is my favorite menu you have from teaching those kids? Oh, look, I have so many memories, Abdella. Um, I I just think the best memory oh, and teaching kids in this way, that when you see them in public, this is where I really like it, and they come up to you, they run up to you and they say, Hi Jake, how are you? What are you doing? And you think, wow, I've done my job. That's why I'm doing this, right? Oh my gosh, there's so many questions. Uh, wonderful, oh, any useful possessions for, yes. I really wanted to show you, right? Um, sorry, this is from Catalina Villagran. She says, I'm assuming she, uh, any usual, suge any suggestions for students experiencing blended learning? Right, every activity, um, every activity that, oh, right. Every activity that, uh, a student does on an app, every activity that they do can be translated into something blended. I actually wanted to share some pictures of that today. Um, I really wanted to share some pictures of that today that say they're doing something like we have a game where they have to match two monsters together and they play that on the app at home and then you can let them draw their own monster and then start to play that with each other. So this is nice blended learning happening there where they're, they're taking what's happening in the app and getting that onto paper getting that into other other skills that they can develop like reading and writing etc are there any ways to gauge and measure learning well hopefully that's what i was trying to show you that from these apps you can actually start to measure not just uh, the skills of learning but you actually um okay lovely uh you, you, you actually start to see from the data and what we saw there with Adam Black's data is that you start to see much more than just the, the vocabulary or grammar they're acquiring. 
Now, it's great to see, okay, they've acquired these words because they've, we, they've seen this word 21 times and 18 times they've been correct. So we know that's, that's they're learning something with the words. But what's much more interesting is how many times did they go back to the app? How long did they stay in the app? Did they, um, did they, did they, did they fall off very quickly? How long did, were they just watching videos and not doing anything? Because that teaches you how they're learning as well, which I find the most interesting. Yeah, uh, can I, um, Anwar, Anwar, this is a great question. I wanted to address this, but I didn't have time. How to avoid the threats of technologies to social competencies? Um, Anwar, this is a great, great question. I was recently talking to Katerina Gospich about this, and she says that even though she's, you know, an advocate of technology and ed tech, that one of the biggest problems that's happening to adults as well is that we use our phones so much that we are starting to lose the ability to do certain things. For example, we're losing the ability to our sense of direction because we're going around and we just use our Google map. We don't need anything else. So we don't get lost anymore. And because we're not getting lost, um, we're starting to lose some of those sort of that, that ability to go down and find things on our own. We don't get lost out in the, you know, if we're ordering food now, we look it up and go, what's the best food? Let's go and get that. If we want to go to a restaurant, we look it up and then we go do that. So I agree, um, uh, Amwa, that one of the ways to avoid the threats of, you know, kids social competencies is put the phones away sometime let them go be free on their own let them go play in the forest as Katerina Gospich says let them go get lost sometimes we're so safe now and technology is actually making us a lot safer than we think so it, I hope that answers your question how can we connect these games oh that's a really good question Alam yeah so it is interesting right because it's not exactly what is happening in real life. We are starting to see some games coming out where the kids actually have to go and find something in their real life. So it says, find something red, and they go find that. So there's a connection there. And then they take a photo, and then they send that back through. But I think that, like, what I was trying to show you with the WeChat activity, happening at home, it's really about what they did. So it's really just about trying to personalize after they've learned the language. So say we're doing the animal game. Well, of course, when they come to class, the connection would be, what's your favorite animal? Why do you like the animal? Um, you know, where have you seen that animal before? So the fun part is on the app. And then the meaningful part is what you do in class is talking about all that stuff around the app, because a lot of learnings happened at home. You know, this is very similar to what what people talk about as the, the flipped classroom, right? Um, Khan Academy, for et cetera. The flipped classroom is do a lot of learning at home, so there's a lot more meaning happening in class. Um, I'm actually answering the questions in the in the question answer things. Uh, how could employ this on adults? Yeah, that's a, <laughs> that's an interesting one, Mohammed. One thing that is lovely from cognitive science is that learners adults don't lose lose their ability to learn new things at any age so let me just make a point about this um adults love to have fun yeah they might not want to play the game with the pop-up thing but there's so much they could be doing with integrating the social media they're using um to 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 integrate that into their learning process can i just say one really quick story about you know a lot of this was about young learners but a lot of the research on how the brain's um, elastic elasticity works came from some scientists doing some math tests with a lady in France who was 100 years old, and they would test her. Um, uh, they would test her every six months on a math test. After four or five years, three years or something, she started getting better on the math test. Not worse, but better on the math test at 103. And they realized this was because um, uh, they realized this was because 
the tests were challenging her mind actively. They were giving her something to focus attention on and keeping her mind active. So then she actually did better on the test by the time she was 106, which really which amazes me because a lot of adults say, oh, well, I can't do that. I'm too old to learn, which apparently is just, just not, not true. Oh my gosh, so many questions here. Did you join learners at their home? Oh no, that was an old question. Um, I just wanted to, re I don't know if these are going up or up or down, right? <laughs> Connecting home and school is done through communication with parents. And I really believe it is crucial in order to communicate with, do you use tools? Oh, do you use tools like Dojo? Yeah, Class Dojo and Edmodo. I've used it in the past, but now I'm working in a state school. It's really interesting. Um, Edmodo, uh, sorry, Class Dojo, my daughter's school uses it. I think it's okay, but I think it's trying I don't want to be critical of anyone in ed tech, but I think it's trying so hard to, you know, put a sort of a, a discourse around the communication. Do you know what I think the best tools for communicating with parents is? The tool that you would use to communicate with your friends with. WeChat, Line, WhatsApp, Facebook, because that's where the parents are. I find it quite difficult as a parent remembering I've got to look at class dojo and then look at this thing called ding and then look at this I just want to go where I'm actually already communicating uh, any other questions here oh yeah what's your advice for someone who will start teaching kids I tried once and I gave up oh Abdella you gave up uh, so chatty and energetic okay okay I find that um uh, oh, thanks a million. That's lovely. Uh, Abdella, that's a great question. They are so chatty and they are very hard to control. But I would say my advice with training teachers over the last 15 years has been the reason that they are being chatty or the reason that they are not focused is because they're not focused in on the learning. So you've got to, by just taking things like thinking, okay, how am I going to get their attention today? I'm going to come in and get something to get their attention by giving them choice, by letting them choose something. Okay. Today you're either going to do a or B and by choosing they get less chatty because they're focused in on something. So I think lots of you know, providing a task like building a tower out of Lego or, you know, drawing the biggest house or designing a shopping center uh, reference to Ross Thorburn there uh, designing a shopping center is is something that'll keep them focused so they have less time to task, uh, less time to be chatty. Wow. Oh, Patricia Black. Research at Karolinska has found scanning skills for reading in a phone lead to lower comprehension. That's really interesting. I'll have to look that. Can you put the reference in for that? Um, I mean, I've never actually used a phone for teaching reading. I'm a mass, I can't find that question now, it's gone. Oh gosh, there was a really nice question there and I only got halfway through the question that said, Patricia Black, can you type that? Where are you? I've got to find that question again. That was a really interesting question. Sorry, Patricia, Patricia. Okay, I've only got two minutes left and I just want to wrap up and say one thing before I, before I finish up. But I really, if Patricia Black, if you can just drop a link in here to what that research is, I'd love to see it because reading is really, really difficult. They often say reading is the most difficult task a young learner mind will ever have to take on. Okay, guys, I only have a minute left. So I just wanna say two minutes left. So David, Mr. David, I just want to uh, wrap up. I wanna say one last thing, guys, about, I just wanna say a final word about the YLT SIG before I go. Um, I was amazed to find out that there is a special interest group focusing on young learners. Because in reality, guys, by far, the majority of learners in the world are young learners. So I find it really interesting. It should be that adults are the special interest group because way more teachers teach uh, young learners than teach adults. So I'm really, really, I'm so happy that StudyCat could do something together with the YLT SIG and David and his team to offer more opportunities for learning that all the presenters that are here are going to be giving up time to really help with this idea of learning and young learners. And what I really want to say before I go is thank you to all the people who attended here 
Because what it's showing is that you are investing your time to create better opportunities for young learners around the world. So thank you very much. Have a great day. And I'm going to have a great night because it's, it's finally over. And um, have a wonderful time. Bye-bye. Bye, Sumin. Bye, Stephanie. Bye, Mohan, Annabella, Haley, Daniela. You can just cut me off, David, whenever you feel All like right. you want. Thank you so much, um, Jeff, for, for your plenary. Much food for thought there. Really, really interesting around the apps and their potential for connecting home and school. And I think there's much room for more research, exploration, experimentation in the future. So I mm. think you seen for much thought for the participants so thank you so much again for your plenary today thank you everybody have a great night or great day bye david thank you bye bye